Are you ready to accelerate the growth of your business? Welcome to the Revenue Growth Podcast. This is the place for business owners, sales leaders, and marketing professionals to get ideas and inspiration to drive exponential revenue growth. Each week, you'll get actionable insights from the world's leading marketing and sales thought leaders and practitioners. Are you ready to grow? Let's join our host, Daryl Amy, author of Revenue Growth Engine. Welcome back to the Revenue Growth Podcast. Your host, Daryl Amy, trailblazer and growth architect on a mission to help 10,000 purpose-driven companies double revenue so we could generate $10 billion in net new giving. We've got a fantastic conversation lined up for you today. We're going to take a look at win-loss analysis close up with some very interesting insights from our new friend, Spencer Dent, who'll be joining us in the studio in just a moment. This week's episode is brought to you by our friends at Selling from the Heart. And if you want to grow sales, especially if you're in a highly relational sales industry, your sales team needs to be able to build and sustain trust with prospects and clients. That's what Selling from the Heart is all about, enabling sales reps to build trust. If that sounds like something that is important to your organization, I invite you to go to sellingfromtheheart.net and learn more about how companies are enabling their sales teams to be able to build and sustain trust so that they can close more business. Speaking of closing business, we've got a great guest today. Spencer Dent is the founder at Closed. He's previously head of demand generation and marketing operation at Qualtrics and a case team leader at Bain & Company. Incredible history of experience in working in marketing and sales roles. Um, And what we're going to find today is some very relevant, fresh data on what it means to analyze win-loss and pipelines. Uh, We're pulling the sheet back on what actually is going on out there. Spencer is going to bring some very fresh and interesting perspectives to us today. So without further ado, Spencer, welcome to the Revenue Growth Podcast. It's great to have you here. Thanks, I appreciate it. Excited to be here. This is fun. Well, you get an up close and personal look at what's going on. Look, I know, and being in uh, in the sales business as sales professionals, we have a lot of reasons that we give as to why we lost a deal, why we won a deal. But I'm guessing, as you look at the data that you get as you work with closed and that you do win loss analysis, that what the salespeople are saying about why they won or lost a deal and what actually is going on might not exactly line up what are you finding out there man you just like hit it what i'm about to tell you is probably going to confirm what you know but maybe shock you to the extent um that the stat will give you so what we do at close is we work with clients and they help they hire us to go out and we have a technology platform where we can go out we can engage their buyers through surveys and interview we'll actually go interview their buyers about what happened, right? This is after the deal's done, win or loss, what happened, why? And so, you know, do sales reps know why? So here, here's here's two stats that I think are going to scare any sales leader um, and make you really think about why you're asking reps why they won or lost deals and if you should even do that and is there a better way? So the first stat is this. Hmm. When I get what a rep put in the system in terms of the competitor versus when I go talk to the buyer and who the buyer said the actual competitor was 65% of the time, two out of three times who the rep put in was wrong. Wow. Better. Okay. So that's, wow. That's the first one. And and think about how these two come come, compound on each other. The second one is, is if it's a lost deal, Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's a lost deal. And I went into Salesforce and I wrote price or I put in product or whatever, like a sales reps never the price was too high. Product. You're right. <laughs> yeah. They're never going to be like, dude, I blew it on the, on the product demo or I didn't follow up. Um, right. When the rep, the rep loss reason against when we go talk to buyers, now keep this in mind, we will tag all the reasons why they didn't, why the, that the buyer mentions mm-hmm. 85% of the time. That one reason that the rep chose doesn't even show up on the list of what the buyers told us. So when you you actually step back from that and you think, man, 
two thirds of the time we're, we're tagging the wrong competitor. Almost eight or nine at 10, not eight or nine out of 10 times. We're saying the wrong reasons. No wonder people are like, dude, that data is garbage. We can't really use it. And what was even more dangerous because it doesn't like pass the sniff test oftentimes for companies, but also the other thing that happens Daryl, is they don't, even if they do believe it and they do act on it, it gets, you're going to make the wrong decisions. You're going to go fix a right. problem against a competitor that doesn't even exist. Well, I really, I love this. And I, as, as you're saying this, I'm just remembering I'm having flashbacks back in when I had a marketing agency. One of the things we used to do is we would do case studies. And this was always my favorite thing to do before I did a case study interview, Spencer, I'd just call up the rep and go, Hey, can you give me the backstory on this? Tell me, you know, <laughs> why did they buy this? These are for closed one deals, right? Yeah. Why did they buy? And it's so funny because 90 five out of a hundred times, maybe higher, they would say, well, they bought because we saved them money. It was a price thing, right? It was a ROI. And so I would inevitably call up, do the interview and, and talk to, and, and, and they would rattle off all of the different reasons they bought the benefits and the outcomes they were getting all of that. And most of the time I'd kind of have to just tactfully say, Hey, by the way, are you tracking the ROI on this? Like, is that even on your radar? And most people would go, uh, not really. I think, I think we're saving money, but I really like this, this, this. And I'd always go back to the rep and go, Hey, do you want to know why people actually buy from you? And do you want to know how much yeah. money you left on the table? Cause they would have paid a premium for all these benefits you just gave. You felt totally. like you had to save them money. So you figured out a way to do this on a more automated and consistent basis. It sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's think, think of it this way. Um, if you're not doing it systematically, mm. you're going to get bad signals and that, that you can't trust. And you're also going to get out of touch with what's happening on the front line. So it should be, the final step in any B2B sales process, right? I'm I'm if I'm willing to invest all this money to chase these deals and sales reps and sales development reps and all the marketing dollars, I should track it all the way through and figure out at, win or lose. Let's go to the buyers afterwards and say, Hey, like, you know, and, and there's different mediums for how you go to them. Electronic uh, interviews, conversations like this. Mm-hmm. What happened? Why? And the crazy thing that happens when you do that is if you do it systematically, you'll get a really good sense of what's going through buyers' minds as they evaluate you. You'll be able to aggregate that across your pipeline, see everything that's going on. And, and then, but also like isolate pockets, like, man, something's going on with this team or something's going on with this sales, uh, this product line, something's going on with this region and be able to figure out if there's there are different reasons for vari variances in performance. And it allows you as a, as a team, as a leadership team, as an owner of a business, as a sales leader, as a marketing leader, to make the right decisions faster because you're not having to wait. And one all of a sudden the results are there and it's been a it's a quarter or two quarters in a row that you miss on something, and then you finally decide to go dig into it. Yeah. You'll know already what was happening because that will be have been flowing into your business like on a regular cadence so that the, the org can pivot and react very quickly to what's happening on the front line. Well, and I think this is such an important time to have your ear to the ground and really be paying attention to what's going on because in all sorts of different industries and just in the economy as a whole in in the world, I mean, this is a very dynamic time. And the <laughs> criteria for decision making is shifting. And really what I'm curious, because you get to look at a lot yeah. of data across multiple yeah. industries. What are you seeing out there when it comes to decisions? Why are people saying yes? Why are they kicking yeah. the can? Why are they saying no? Yeah, t tons of turbulence, right? Tons of like if, if you just rewind, rewind like a year ago, right? Um, all of a sudden you start hearing like, oh, there might be a recession coming. There might be a recession coming. Well, in Q1 and Q2 of 2022, we saw a meaningful spike across a lot of our clients. 
And overall, it was like a 50% increase in the number of deals that were being lost to no competitor or pushed. And so think this is like thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of deals across hundreds of companies that we work with. And the only explanation for that is, oh, we are already in a recession in these B2B industries that we serve, right? And wow. the definition of a the, the it's rough out there right now, right? Mm -hmm. The toughest thing that's happening right now is nothing is happening, right? Everything's getting paused. And so you started to see a lot of turbulence in Q1, Q2 of last year, Q3, Q4 across our clients. We saw a lot, a lot of challenges. Um, and the funny thing about that is what's happening now, like it's almost like everybody's aware that the economy is in a rough spot, that we have, a, you know, the situation where um, there's tons of inflation and budgets getting cut. There's layoffs all over the place. We've all, we've kind of gotten through the stages of, of mourning of like, now we're accepting that what's happening now is it's normalized in terms of the deals. Like we're not seeing as many just random, like, deals getting cut right at the finish line. Like we saw a lot of our clients having deals get like, we went all the way through the process and they added the, the buying company added an extra step where you had to get final approval from the CFO mm. and that never existed before. So all of a sudden you have like new challenges. What's happening now is it's stabilized a little bit more and it's more about, okay, if you're going to get the at bats, you better make the most of them. You know, is, is a good is a good way to think about it. But I think one of the things that a, a lot of companies I think are seeing right now, and maybe this applies to some of the folks that are watching this, stuff that worked a year ago to drive to build pipeline. Mm -hmm. the, the answer in most businesses is let's go just find more deals. Let's go build more pipeline, build more pipeline, build more pipeline. Well, right. Stuff that worked a year ago to build pipeline isn't working right now. Like because the. The, those people aren't out looking, right? They're not out looking. They're not allowed to be out looking, or maybe they were even laid off. From the pe that person who owned that budget no longer works at a co at the company. So, um, I've seen lots of companies say, you know, last year or in years prior, we would go to certain conferences or spend sponsoring certain events, and, and it's harder to find the deals. We're seeing things where the persona that I used to sell to in this environment is frozen, right? Their budgets are frozen. And you're, you're seeing a lot of companies pivot and try to, you'll see messaging if you look on LinkedIn or things like that. Companies are trying to push their um, solutions more towards CFOs. Like here's the ROI business case of why you should use this. Mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing that thing. But the biggest thing that I we're seeing companies do is say, okay, I'm not going to get as many at bats, how do I get the most out of every at bat? How do I optimize my go-to-market efficiency as much as possible? Hmm. That's probably the biggest thing that I think we're seeing. Like people are accepting of what's going on. They're going to continue to keep their foot on the gas as much as possible, trying to build pipeline. But at the end of the day, they're like, there's no way we're going to, we need to figure out how to incre increase our win rate. Yeah. I, it's, I think, first of all, I think you should have a contract with a commerce department to tell them what's going on in the economy, because <laughs> seriously, like pipelines are where you learn what's actually going on in the economy, not all this trailing data. It's, it's kind of funny. But um, if you think about the tapping of the brake, which that, you know, when I look at when interest rates start going up and there's uncertainty in the economy, it's not that there's a hard stop. There's just the tapping of the brake. And it's yeah. like when you're driving home from work tonight, right? Someone taps the brake and yeah. next thing you know, you know, you got a traffic jam um, inside that. So I'm curious for the deals that are being won in this environment, you mentioned that, um, you know, there's fewer at bats. You've got to be more efficient. What's what is what what are you seeing yeah. that's actually pushing the deals over the finish line and and getting them unstuck but also getting them over you know to win or close yeah. one yeah great great question it kind of depends on the market you're operating in um mm -hmm. but very very good question so let, let's put on one side of the table i'm operating in like a very competitive market where it's me and three or four other you know 
pretty equally weighted fighters. And in those situations, the people that are winning those deals are the ones who are able to just prove out head to head why they have the more valuable solution. They have the better case studies. They have the cleaner demos. They have the, the, um, they really just speak to the needs of the people that they're selling to in a more targeted way. Like what you mentioned right out of the gates, you know, this selling from the heart, right. And like building trust with buyers. We see that come through all the time. And the way buyers describe that is, they really understood my needs and it didn't feel like a sales process. It felt like they understood what my pain points were and they were selling to me, you know, like, but not, it didn't feel like they were selling to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in those situations where it's super competitive and there's multiple players that they're evaluating, the more the buyers come to trust your brand, your solution, that it will meet their needs, the better off you are. The other side of the table I'll give you is it's a novel solution. Okay. They aren't using mm -hmm. something like this before. It might be a first time buyer. Honestly, that's what we are for most companies. Like win loss as a platform practice is a newer solution. And the challenge that we run into and that companies like us run into in this environment is wait a second. I've never done this. I don't have budget outlined for it. How do I make that business case? How do I make the ROI right. business case for why I mm -hmm. should do this? And in those cases, the key to success is being able to actually come with the proof points, you know, being able to say our client, here's quotes from clients, here's solution, here's what our buyer, letting your buyer speak to why they choose you publicly is super important for the novel buyers, for the for the experienced, very competitive, mature markets, like oftentimes it's funny, like those buyers, when they describe the solutions, they know them better than the sellers. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, mm -hmm. I, I know, think contact center solutions, think, you know, ERP systems. Like mm -hmm. I know that stuff better because uh, I've used all of them and I know what I like and don't like about them. When it's novel, it's like, I've never used this. It's actually super interesting. It's kind of cool that you guys sell something like this. I've, I feel like I'm learning as I'm talking to you. And then when you can show me what other people are saying and you can help me calculate a business case and justify the spend for it, that gets me to pull the trigger. So it, in this environment, the key is those two, those two sides, I would say, you know, based off of what we're seeing across, across the board. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm curious what you think about this, because what I see is a shift from a lot of, um, active demand, um, you know, where people are going in and, and, you know, this whole trend towards when the market was hot, we got intent data, we'll figure out who's buying this stuff, we'll go get them. Um, we'll, we'll do all of that to um, what Keith Eads uh, years ago wrote a book called The New Solution Selling. And he talked about latent demand yeah. and that, you know, this is there's no, they're not looking. Yes, they're not searching. They're yes. stuck. Um, they're yes. sitting in their office going, I can't spend <laughs> any money. I don't, you know, I don't know what to do, I yeah. don't, you know, and, the, but then, but the need is real, you know, in the case of closed, we're not closing business. Why were people saying no, you know, so the need is there, but the role of the salesperson, the marketing is not so much just gathering leads off the internet and, and all of that. The role is figuring out who you want to engage with and proactively engaging. Like it seemed like the the script has Flip. flipped in the last 18 months from totally. inbound to outbound from, you know, attract to go get it. And, um, and in the go, here's, here's my point behind this. And what I think is really interesting about close in this context is if you're going to go get it, you need to understand what's going on in the mind of the buyer right yeah. now not yeah. generic marketing. We can help you increase productivity, enhance, blah, blah, blah. Like you need to know specifically in your industries what's going on. And it seems to me that doing this type of after action report is for my marketing friends listening in, like there's gotta be gold nuggets in some of this stuff right now that, that you're uncovering. A hundred percent. So, so, so this is interesting, right? Um, I think you nailed the latent demand thing, right? People are budgets are frozen. People are, are 
they're nervous about job security. They don't want to spend money and lose their yeah. job, yeah, right? Like I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm scared to do would be that guy. Mm -hmm. And, but it's that much more important for your company to know what's going on so you can move. And the interesting, th the interesting thing about this, Daryl, is historically the way this practice was done, the practice of win-loss was done, was in a very academic project-based way. So like, hey, let's go figure out why we don't lose. We'll get somebody from the product team, somebody from the marketing team, somebody from the sales team. We'll put together a PowerPoint. We'll present it to the executive team. And that, that's mm -hmm. how it was done. Um, then it moved to, let's put some drop downs in the CRM. Well, I told you earlier why that's a horrible idea and we'll watch out for that. And in defense of my salespeople who I love, right? All the salespeople, right. I love salespeople. Like buyers lie to you and they don't tell you what happened either, right? Like All the time, like yeah. The, the, the way I would describe it is like the B2B sales process is like a poker game that you never have to lay your cards down. <laughs> Right. So like right. I got up from the table and I no ever sees had the no card. idea. I, maybe I took your chips. Maybe I didn't take your chips. Right. Maybe I, you, I gave you mine. Maybe I didn't, but you don't know why I did that. So I don't even we, know how many chips you have in your stack. Like, exactly. Totally <laughs> mystery, right? <laughs> exactly. So going backwards after and be like, Hey, let's figure out what happened here. Good or mm. bad. And what we could have done better is really important. But here's the interesting thing. You think about the marketing team. And the marketing team oftentimes is charged with the responsibility to go figure out what's happening in the market. Well, the, the feedback that you can gather in win loss isn't just applicable to the marketing team. It's applicable to the product team. It's applicable to the sales team. It's applicable to mm -hmm. the people in charge of product and pricing, in charge of your partnership strategy, Strategic whatever planning. it happens yeah, to be. All of it. And what we find is the companies that get the most value out of running win loss syst systematically as like an operationalized motion is they turn it from an academic process into an operational process. So feedback comes mm -hmm. in and instead of it sitting in some, on somebody's machine and being turned into a PowerPoint deck and then read out three months later in some, you know, review session, mm -hmm. you just push it to the people that it matters. So I'm the sales rep. I lost the deal or I won the deal and we get a deal review that comes through, send me the deal so I can learn from it. What happened? I'm the head of North America sales. Send me everything you're hearing about my team every week or every month or every two months so that I can have this ongoing view of what's happening. I'm in charge of product. I'm planning the roadmap for next quarter right now. I don't need to wait until, you know, the end of June to hear our clients are asking for these features or these elements to be built into our solution. So the more you can, the way this really helps you impact and move, think of like the time of this is what's happening in the market to my team and the relevant teams are acting on it. The more you can compress those together and get the information to the hands of the people who can do something about it, the better off your company will be, right? You don't need mm -hmm. to wait and filter it from the executive team to the second hand man, second line managers down all the way to the sales rep who needs to just learn, Hey, when you talk about pricing, just be super straightforward and blunt about it and don't hide anything. Like if a buyer said that about me and I was a sales rep, I would want to know it so that on the call I go tomorrow, I don't screw it up again. That's yeah, right. That's a long way of saying like the value you get from this stuff is actually incredibly cross-functional, but the only way you get that value is to get it into the hands of the people who can do something about it. I absolutely love this. This is a fascinating conversation. I'm super excited about what you've created in Revenue Growth Engine. I'm a massive advocate for after action reports where we get, you know, the team gets together and says, give me a deal we won. Give me one we lost. Give me one that's stuck in the pipeline. Let's analyze it. But the reality is, you know, if, if you're just sitting in your conference room doing that, you don't really know. I see the yeah. incredible benefit here of getting real unfiltered advice from people on the buying team that you can go back and operationalize immediately. And yeah. what you've got going on is super, super cool. I'm really, really excited about it, Spencer. This is, this is great. How can people learn more about closed and, and uh, how can they get involved? Yeah, totally. Um, obviously check out our website, closed, C-L-O-Z-D.com. We're one of those, 
lame tech companies that decided or ZD for my uh, my Canadian friends. But yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, also, if you're interested, the, if you go to close.com, there's a bunch of content on there. If because this is a relatively novel new practice, and a lot of companies are trying to do it. And I would compare it to what you saw happen in like the customer experience world in the early 2000s, going from one-off surveys and and NPS studies to being every time you buy something on Amazon, you get asked, did you like this? Or right. Not? That's mm-hmm. what's happening in the, in the win loss space. Um, so we have a lot of content on there that can help, help you. If you actually want to just try it out, like sales professionals, marketing leaders, if you guys have a deal that you just recently lost, that was painful or that you won that you're trying to figure out what happened and you feel like you'd benefit from having an independent third party, go talk to them. Just go to freebuyerinterview.com. Oh, you cool. can sign up. We'll do it for it. We'll, we'll do a, a free interview for you to help you see like what this, what good looks like so that you can benchmark against it in the future as you know, kind of the leader in this space. We've been doing this for six years. Now we have hundreds of clients and we can kind of, a lot of companies when they're trying to think about like, how would I do this? That's a great way for you to see like, this is what the best, the best process that companies are running with today. So happy to do that for you. Honestly, too, Daryl, people can reach out to me. It's just Spencer at close.com. I'm, I love talking to sales leaders, marketing leaders, hearing what they have going on, answering any questions, telling them what we're seeing. And these types of conversations are awesome. Super. Well, I really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise with us today. I am super, super excited about what's going on at Close. I know our audience will be as well. So Spencer, um, hats off to to you. Uh, We're here at the Revenue Growth Podcast. We're cheering you on. I think you're on a great mission. And I think this is something that is super critical right now. So I appreciate you sharing time here. Hey, thank you, man. Appreciate coming on. Anytime you're out this way, let us know. We'll go Record snows in Utah this year. If you guys want to come ski, we'll no doubt. You guys are skiing until August this year. So it's going to be great. Hey, Spencer, thank you. I appreciate you so much. And thank you to everybody in the Revenue Growth Podcast audience. The topic that we've talked about here today is right at the heartbeat of the revenue growth engine. And that is buyers don't buy products and services, they buy the outcomes your products and services enable. How do you know what outcomes are hot? What Spencer's talked about here today and what Close has put together gives you real-time data into all of that. So I'm super excited uh, about the conversations that are going to happen around win-loss analysis as we take a look at some of these brand new tools and, and look at what is possible in our dynamic marketplace. And this is a dynamic marketplace right now. As we wrap today, I just want to say thank you to all the marketing, all the sales professionals, all the entrepreneurs who are out there being dynamic, figuring things out, moving business forward. Our economy, our our society depends on you. So the work that you're doing, you're out working hard, you're making things happen. And I want to say thank you. My commitment to you at the Revenue Growth Podcast is to continue to bring you ideas that help you scale your revenue so you can make an impact. So make sure to like or subscribe. And thank you to everybody who's leaving reviews for the podcast. I appreciate you. We've got great guests scheduled throughout the rest of the spring and the summer. So uh, we'll see you next time. And until then, let's get going and let's get growing.